listening to In the Medical Room, our weekly focus on health, brought to you by the Valley Private Hospital, Mulgrave. And with thanks to the Valley Private Hospital in Mulgrave, today we're talking about the importance of digestive health. And joining me is uh, Dr. Anil Kumar Astana, who's a gastroenterologist at the Valley Private. Uh, Good afternoon, Uh, Doctor. Welcome to the program. Good afternoon, Kevin. Thank you for having me on the program today. Now, we're talking about the importance of digestive health, and I guess a lot of people think that's uh, things like uh, burping and diarrhea and vomiting. Uh, is, there, is there more to it than that? Yeah, Kevin, certainly. There, there is a lot more than that. Um, but things like burping, diarrhea, vomiting are certainly the social um, mishaps which people can suffer from digestive mishealth. But really, the digestive tract is a very long tract consisting of a lot of organs. So you've got your swallowing tubes, you've got your stomach, your pancreas, your liver, and your gut. And it's not only important for digestion. The digestive system also filters our toxins. It's got a very crucial role in maintaining our immunity to fight off infections, as well as producing some important proteins such as clotting our blood. So really it does extend beyond just digestion. And just putting things a bit in perspective, Kevin, uh, for for us Australians, bowel cancer is the second most common cancer in Australia. Um, And it's more common in men than in women. About 15,500 Australians are told every year that they have bowel cancer. So it's it's a potentially very serious condition involved in the digestive tract. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, we we read a lot of stuff about that. It's also bowel cancer is also one of the most uh, ones that can be effectively treated. That's absolutely right. So and bowel... and particularly if caught early. Yeah, spot on, Kevin. That's a great point to make. So with bowel cancer, the key point I want to home in, like you said, is if it is picked up early, up to ninety percent of people can be cured of the cancer, and that's exactly why cancer detection of the bowel makes up such a large part of our workload in the hospitals. Now, the problem with bowel cancer is very often the person may not develop any warning signs. There may not be any symptoms for years while the cancer is growing. What we have found from research is sometimes there can be leakage of very small amounts of blood in the stool. And that is where we've got our national bowel cancer screening program in place in Australia. And it's really important at the age of 50, the person is invited to participate in this program and they send the stool sample off to the laboratory, it's analysed and if it comes back positive for the blood, then they are invited to have a colonoscopy done. Yep. Now before we get to that, that we should just point out, that's, uh, that's a, a kit that's sent to your home, isn't it? That's absolutely right. It's a kit with two pots. And uh, spatula, it's certainly not the most elegant test to undergo. Um, and I completely acknowledge that. Yeah. But it saves a lot of lives. And um, it's been proven time and time again with research that it does improve survival for the person. Now, you mentioned the word colonoscopy. Now, someone of my age has had a couple of those already. I know they're a, a, a very, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, how would you say, it's not the most pleasant thing you'll ever have uh, yeah. done in your life. Well, welcome to the club, Kevin. But yeah, so with the colonoscopies, uh, it's really, there's a lot of misconceptions around colonoscopies, and I'd like to spend a few moments on that. Absolutely. Firstly, firstly, I'd like to emphasize that colonoscopy is not surgery. So there are no external cuts, no external incisions made. It is a thin camera which is used to examine the bowel from the anus to the beginning of the large bowel. And the function and the use of it is not only to pick up cancers, but to pick up something called polyps. Now, polyps are just growths which are found on the inside of the bowel wall. Most of them are not cancerous, but if they are left alone, many can become cancerous. They are small and they are very easy to remove with the colonoscopy. And that is one of the main reasons we emphasize that people must have this if their blood stool test comes back positive. In terms of the procedure itself, as you have already mentioned, the day before, the person is advised to drink some fluid, and the function of that is to clear the bowels out. Yep. Um, unfortunately, there's no way around it. You do need to be near a toilet many times, but 
the clearer the bow, the better views we will get when we perform the colonoscopy. Yep, and you just you go basically go to the chemist or or to the place where you're having the procedure done. You get a kit given to you that you have a couple of little bottles of stuff you have to drink. Yep, that's absolutely right. And now these these drinks are even coming in different flavours. So if you like, a thank goodness, or... the first time yeah. I had it, it tasted like seawater. It was bloody <laughs> awful. Well, that's right. That's right. So I, we we've moved on a little bit. Uh, we're getting there. So they can come in different flavours. And we advise the person to take two or three drinks the day before. But at the same time, we do advise the patient to rehydrate themselves and drink plenty of oral fluid because sometimes you can become dehydrated. On the day itself, it's a very fairly simple procedure, as you may recall. You go in and then you meet the anaesthetist who will give you sedation. Now, sedation is not the same as a general anaesthetic. You are not knocked out but you are very, very sleepy so that you do not remember anything about the procedure. The procedure itself lasts about 15 to 20 minutes, during which time, if there are any polyps, we can remove them. You, you then go to the recovery bay, and then the proceduralist, myself in this case, will come and speak to you after the procedure. And you do get, someone needs to drive you home because you are a bit drowsy, so you, you, you have to sort of organise all those sorts of things too. That's absolutely right. So we always advise people who undergo this procedure, they must not return home alone. There must be someone to accompany them and to rest for the remaining of that day. But then the next day they can resume work. Um, if they are involved with heavy machinery, then we will have a chat to them and we will say, if you're still feeling a bit drowsy in the morning, then don't go to work. Yep. And the, the worst uh, case scenario coming out of that is that you do find a cancer. That's absolutely right. So just to illustrate that point, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had done a colonoscopy on a, a lady who had just turned 50. She was symptomatically completely well, no family history of any cancers whatsoever. So she was a bit puzzled what the fuss was about. Her stool test had come back positive. She was adamant there was no blood that she could see in the toilet. I was performing the colonoscopy halfway through. I see a very large cancer blocking the bowel. Mm. Now, I was absolutely shocked because that size cancer, I was very, very surprised that she was not experiencing any symptoms at all. So it just highlights the importance of following this screening program and that it is there for a reason. And I really urge all the listeners to please go ahead with it, even if they are feeling completely well. Uh, now, you mentioned it's a, it's a number of the organs of the body that are involved in uh, in digestive health, and we're speaking to uh, Dr. Anil uh, Astana, uh, a gastroenterologist at the uh, Valley Private Hospital in Mulgrave. Um, uh, let's move on to the liver now. Sure. The liver, Kevin, one of those silent organs. It hasn't received as much awareness as some of the other organs, but, again, putting things in perspective, about 6 million Australians are affected by liver disease at this moment in time, wow. of which about 7,000 die every year. And the reason, I guess, liver is important to highlight is because the prevalence of liver diseases is exponentially increasing. We all know our excess of alcohol can affect the liver. We know hepatitis C and hepatitis B viruses can. But the new kid on the block almost which is really increasing the liver burden or liver disease burden, is obesity and being overweight. All right. And this is a topic which really it's not got out there very much compared to other conditions. So what I'm touching upon is something called NAFLD, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So if someone just drinks socially, which is absolutely fine, um, but they are a bit overweight, they may have diabetes, what happens, Kevin, is over time fat is deposited into the liver. In the initial stages, that is not a problem. But if that continues and the liver cells have excessive fat deposited, they become irritated. So you then get hepatitis. Imagine rubbing your skin continuously. Your skin will eventually turn red and you'll get a stinging sensation. That's the exact process which happens in the liver with this continuous fat deposition. And what we're finding is when that hepatitis is present because of the fat, the normal liver tissue can become replaced with scar tissue. And that condition is called liver cirrhosis. Yep. That's a very serious condition because it's irreversible. 
it's you can't go back and the person becomes very very sick as you remember in the beginning of our interview we highlighted how the digestive tract is involved with getting rid of toxins while the liver is the organ which does that so you can imagine if the liver is not working well the toxins will 